Okay, so first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. You're uh, the first question is, uh, IonQ recently unveiled roadmap toward building a large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer, and I thought that was very impressive. Uh, could you walk us through the key milestones of this roadmap and share how the company plans to achieve that? So actually, uh, we have been focused on AQ, mm -hmm. which is algorithmic qubits, and getting to 64 uh, AQ. Mm -hmm. We're still on path to do that. It's important to us because as Dr. Jung Sang Kim, when he founded the company, mm -hmm. he wanted to make sure that we focus on the usefulness of the computer. Mm -hmm. And AQ is an indication of what applications and use cases a quantum computer was good for. So we're on track to hit our AQ64 milestone mm -hmm. and getting uh, the ability to ship Tempo class, which is our fifth generation quantum computer, mm -hmm. that will be from between 64 and, up, uh, and 100 and above in qubits. And then we will be shipping other systems, but then as you look at our technology roadmap, you'll see that we will get from 64 to 100 to 256 plus qubits. Mm -hmm. And then as you watch the webinar and it gets through to 10,000 and it gets to all the way up to 2 million qubits. And the technology roadmap requires us to do two things. One is on to be able to put more qubits mm -hmm. on a chip and that's part of the strategy of why we are looking at the acquisition of Oxford Ionics. Mm -hmm. So a single chip that has more qubits and the ability to do that in a cost-effective way. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of getting to that is photonically interconnecting two systems. Mm -hmm. That we've already been well on our way to doing. We, did, we started it with our acquisition with Entangled Networks. Mm -hmm. We just completed the acquisition of LightSync Technologies, another company with world-class photonic interconnects, mm -hmm. and photonically interconnecting two systems will help you get to that scale and that roadmap we delivered. Okay. Uh, since you mentioned it, uh, IonQ has been very active on m and recently, I think, uh, especially about the acquisition of Oxford Ionics. I think it kind of stands out as a particularly uh, strategic acquisition. So uh, what does such m and mean for IonQ's technology and in the long term, how would it benefit IonQ? All of our acquisitions are meant to help us continue to grow and scale. Mm -hmm. So Oxford Ionics in that regard is not unique. Mm -hmm. What is very unique about Oxford Ionics is and it's incredible uh, opportunity for us to invest in the UK market, mm -hmm. to work with some of the finest, most you know, incredible world-class trapped ion physicists, and grow and combine our technologies to grow together. Mm -hmm. So we feel very excited about that one, and that one is particularly, it hasn't closed yet, but it is an opportunity for us to deeply work with the UK tech industry, and in particular with Oxford and the University of Oxford folks that, that went into Oxford Ionics, as well as to be able to enable us to scale our roadmap to where we need to be. Uh, and uh, I see that IQ has frequently been emphasizing on commercial advantage. So what exactly is commercial advantage? And does your recent collaboration between like AstraZeneca and such kind of shows what that like a piece of what that means? Mm -hmm. What do you think? So the word commercial, in particular, we've been saying that we're you know a leading commercial mm -hmm. quantum computing and networking company. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say that is there are a lot of academic research projects mm -hmm. and research institutions that we love to work with that have been dabbling or been deeply investing in both quantum computing and networking. The difference though is we are here to scale the company and scale the compute and the networking and to make sure that there's a commercial use case for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have been talking about that and we wanted to emphasize, we have worked with ANSYS. ANSYS is a very large company that focuses on computer-aided engineering. Mm -hmm. They might not be well known in South Korea, but why we partner with them, they work on all the hard complex like computational fluid dynamics, anything that you need a big supercomputer HPC for. So if they're already working with the biggest computers on earth, Quantum provides them another tool to help solve the same very, very complex problems. So ANSYS works on medical devices, they work on car 
you know, roof crush tests. They work on all of these problems that are very difficult, even with the fastest supercomputer. Mm -hmm. So they're a commercial company and working with them to look at the most pressing commercial problems. AstraZeneca, large, you know, pharmaceutical company. They will make many, much, much profit and they can also make, lose a lot of money on drug discovery, right? It takes a long time and not all drugs actually go to fruition. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a huge like area that as a company they need to sustain an innovation in. So we work at the company that absolutely their fiber of being needs to actually discover drugs faster and reduce costs. So you want to work with companies that have a commercial reason to do it faster. So that's why we work with AstraZeneca. NVIDIA, close partner of ours, they've been working with us on the same you know, drug discovery uh, paper that we wrote on AstraZeneca, AWS, and NVIDIA. All big commercial companies. Yeah. Why we care is because you have the brain power of the best scientists in pharmaceuticals, the best quantum physicists, the best people it, that know how to integrate with us and with AWS on CPU, GPU, QPU. That's why we look at that as a great example of our focus on commercialization. Uh, so far, I think uh, IQ has been proving its value and it's uh, actually making great step forward. But. Uh, what do you think are the biggest technical or operational challenges that you have in order to achieve all of those roadmaps and achieve commercial advantage? I think INQ has all the elements mm -hmm. that we need that has brought us here and that will continue to help us grow. I think all really good companies start with great leaders that are experienced. Unlike a lot of companies, we're led by a lot of experienced people. Mm -hmm. You know, Niccolo Damasi has founded lots of companies, been a public CEO. Peter uh, Chapman, our executive chair, you know, has experience, long-term experience at Amazon, as well as being a great software developer. I was at Microsoft for 20 years. I interned at Intel. Oh. Big companies that care about the compute space, and more importantly, the use case that you need. You know, Rima, our chief revenue officer, she spent time at NVIDIA during the AI revolution. She spent time at Cisco during the internet revolution. She also worked at, Solar at Sun, working on Solaris. You know, our SVP of products, he worked at Google. Mm -hmm. Our head of applications is ex-Microsoft. So you see all of these companies, our CFO, ex-Oracle. We're business people that love technology, that like to focus on the dreams, but also the ability to grow and commercialize technology. Uh Oh yeah, about your CEO, Nicola Damasi. He described INQ as the NVIDIA of quantum computing. So uh, what, does that actually, what does that analogy really mean? And how is INQ kind of pursuing to live up to that vision? I think it means that we're incredibly focused at growing a business mm -hmm. that initially people weren't even sure was part of the compute business. So the analogy is this. When, and I interned at Intel, I have a warm place in my heart for them. But there was a lot of time in the compute industry mm -hmm. where everyone said, all I need is a CPU. Mm -hmm. I just need a computer, it needs a CPU. But then NVIDIA came along and they said, you know, there's two use cases that are incredibly important that need GPUs. Mm -hmm. And what were those? And this is early, early on. They were computer-aided design, CAD, the graphical processing power needed to actually make CAD great, fast, responsive, you know, accurate. Mm -hmm. And this other cool thing called video games. Yeah. Those two things were the killer apps for NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. And it was the early days. This is what created the foundation for them to become the king of AI, yeah. right? And so for us, Microsoft, another analogy, because I worked there too, is Microsoft. Early on in compute, Microsoft wanted, Bill Gates wanted to democratize PCs. Everyone wanted, he wanted people to have it in their hands, not mainframes, PCs. But in the beginning, what were the two killer apps for Microsoft? The two killer apps were, dun dun dun, Office, right? Killer apps, Windows was core. We're an operating system company, right? We have a computer at INQ, but what's it used for? You need apps, you need applications. Microsoft's like, we're gonna bet on Office productivity and called their thing Office. Spreadsheets, you know, Word, Excellent. slides, right? Yeah. The other thing early on, what did they bet on? Flight simulator, video oh, games, hundred yeah. percent, uh, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So when you remember that, and you think, well, what does Microsoft still have Office? Hundred percent. It's in the cloud as well as on-premise. Do they have games? Xbox. Yeah. But we needed 
a catalyst for the usefulness of the platform. But that didn't mean once you had that. That's what when Nicola says narrow quantum advantage, it means there's certain use cases that are incredible that will build the foundation of the company into a very great entity. Because Microsoft was, was doing very well when they had Windows, Office, and, and games. NVIDIA was doing fantastically well with you know CAD as well as uh, video games. And then now they were able to leverage that, to leverage their GPUs to be the engine behind AI, right? Microsoft's able to use that foundation to use it to get from on-premise hybrid and leverage it for the cloud and leverage it for ML and AI. Mm -hmm. So IonQ, we're meeting them there because we okay. think that the world, we don't think, everyone knows this, it's not just us. There will be a world that will be CPUs, GPUs, and QPUs. Mm -hmm. Because we need classical supercomputers, we need the GPUs that are in there, and the CPUs, and we need the quantum processing unit. Because quantum can do stuff that classical cannot. Mm -hmm. And we're symbiotic and we'll work together. So that's why when we talk about in, with the NVIDIA of quantum, we have the same focus on focusing on use cases, building out platform, having the best partners, having the best you know, and brightest people in the industry to, to be able for us to actually uh, hit all of our goals, both technological as well as commercial. And uh, one thing that we found quite interesting was uh, Chris Monroe, IQ's co-founder, one of, uh, he recently returned to the company as chief science advisor. So uh, what role does he actually play as CSA? And like, does that kind of signal his return or something? What, what does it mean? So both Dr. Jung Sang Kim and Dr. Chris Monroe have always and will continue to be involved in IronQ. Mm -hmm. They founded the company and their vision remains the same as far as getting to where we need to go. With, and they both, by the way, still uh, work in, they went, they returned to academia, yeah. so they still are actually professors and they have a workload as professors. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about uh, Chris Monroe is he has been advising us mm -hmm. about, because he is an, an expert in trapped ions and he has, uh, he's been hitting world record, uh, uh, world records that he and Chris Balance, Dr. Chris Balance at Oxford Ion has been trading back and forth mm -hmm. on on, uh, so we have been, Niccolo has been very close to Chris Monroe and has been talking to him. He gives us advice from that level. He's somebody that's a sounding board. The other thing to think of is both for Dr. Kim and Dr. Monroe, they hired physicists that worked under them. Mm -hmm. They still work at INQ. We have a whole lot of physicists who worked under Dr. Kim as well as Dr. Monroe and we have some that work for both of them. So their legacy and their input has, continues to be there, as well as Chris has been giving us all this advice, it had been giving us this advice, and so we decided to make it official. Oh, okay. So it's, it's incredible, but it wasn't the fact that if you had asked Nicola who he's texting, he was texting Dr. Chris Monroe, and he said, let's make it official. He still continues to be a professor, and you know, Dr. Kim has actually taken on a new role as well at, mm -hmm. at Duke, which is an incredible role, but you know, we're a family in the trapped ion space. So. And uh, this would be our last question. Uh, it may be a little bit sensitive, but uh, recent SEC filing shows that there has been a notable volume of insider stock sales, including from like Peter Chapman or Nicola Damasi. You know, this has raised concern among Korean retail investors. So how should these transactions be interpreted in broader context of INQ's business outlook? Well, first, you know, the 10B51 plans that are instituted so that insiders can trade, mm -hmm. those are things that people had instituted months or years before. Yeah. It allows them to trade when they have so much insider information. So those are just a, a mechanism that, you know, executives have that are directors and officers. We don't, I don't comment, and INQ doesn't comment on the personal finances of the people in the company, mm -hmm. but I would say to you, we as a leadership team are very confident and very committed to IMQ. You know, I just had this question from somebody else and they said, how committed are you? And I said, right now I work 20 hours a day. I'm investing my life, wow. right? It's blood, sweat and tears. I have a 17 year old son that I left to come here on his last day of school. Yesterday was his last day of school. Oh, really? But he loves technology. He wants to be an aerospace engineer. Mm -hmm. He understands business. He loves that I'm in this job. Mm -hmm. He's a big supporter. But it would have been hard if he wasn't. But so I would tell you, I've had 30 years of working in technology. Mm -hmm. 
2020 at Microsoft and interned. I've been CMOs of startups and I'm betting with my life here and I feel like that is in and of itself the testament to my belief in the company. And I would say that I've been here now for two years. I like working with people who are smarter than me, who work equally as hard and have the optimism and the drive and the desire to, to win customers and partners. We do believe, mm -hmm. if you do quantum or even compute, I always believe computers would make people's lives better. The difficult things would be easier. Mm -hmm. New discoveries would be made. And that's why I was at Microsoft and, and I worked in compute. Quantum computers are gonna be able to address things supercomputers have not been able to, to solve. The ability to, to progress drugs so that they're discovered faster. What if that drug will be able to help cure cancer? There's more supercomputers looking at climate right now than any other problem case, but still you cannot predict a catastrophic you know, hurricane where lives will be lost and jobs and houses. And if we could predict that and we could ameliorate the, the effects of it, we could evacuate people because our supercomputers with quantum can actually model. It's an incredibly difficult problem, right? Yeah. Modeling all of the variables in the world that then result in whether or not it's sunny or if it's raining or it's catastrophically there's gonna be a typhoon or a hurricane. That's what quantum wants to solve. So part of us are here to drive commercialization because I want a quantum computer in every data center in the world. We're already in the cloud, right? Yeah. We're on AWS and Google and Microsoft, but I want them in the data centers because there's still more data centers than people in the cloud yet in the world. Mm -hmm. And secondarily, there's a heart in this. And what I want in my lifetime, I will live long, but in my lifetime, I'm gonna see meaningful progress to cure the worst diseases on earth. Mm -hmm. I really want that. When you know quantum can actually break encryption, we need our computers to be massively powerful because we're the good guys. Mm -hmm. We are going to help. We know quantum can break encryption, but we know quantum can solve and secure us all. Yeah. We need that. So I believe, I don't know if you can tell, I really believe in the good that compute can do. And if you look at all of the people, as you meet INQ people who mm -hmm. left their families to come here to talk to people in South Korea, because the Seoul and Korea is so important to us. Mm -hmm. I have some of my best team members here. We have our brilliant scientists who are working on the hardest algorithms. Mm -hmm. They're all here because they believe. They leave their families so that we can help, help explain, help ride, help teach. Some of these folks here, they're going to do a hackathon. They're actually going to be right. teaching students this coming weekend for SKKU hackathon. So those are people who do it because they believe. Thank you. That really sounds like total commitment. So I really yeah. appreciate it. 원인 에버슬립 뉴스레터와 네이버 프리미엄 콘텐츠 지금 바로 구독해 보세요. <웃음> <웃음>